So if you just want to give me a thumbs up whenever you're ready. Okay, so good evening and welcome to General Council of October 12th. Uh, first, would like to begin with any identification of any media on the line. Donna from the Two Row Times. Uh, Victoria Gray from the Toronto Island News. Hello, Victoria. Okay, shifting into our next portion, which is any changes or deletions to the agenda. I know I do have one. Uh, we'll have one more uh, delegation after the Community Broadband Task Force, which is a cannabis update, uh, as well as the introduction of our new executive director. Is there anything further? There's Did one you, more we'll also be to the JH or um, to the number seven external committee appointments. It's the J Treaty Border Alliance. Okay, that, that needs to be added as well. Is that right, Tammy? Yes. Okay, is there anything further? Hey, Jason, Nathan. Can we add over um, to you, Nathan? Yeah, can we add flooding and drainage to the agenda? Sure. Okay, can I, I'll then look to a motion for mover and seconder to adopt the agenda moved by Audrey. Seconder. Second by Helen. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, just before we begin on our delegations, um, I, we wanted to share our team. So this is uh, for, for those who were unable to, to join the event on the 30th, uh, the September 30th event that we had at Chiefs of Park. Uh, we did promise and, and we, uh, we hired a videographer and that video has since been um, edited and, and clean cut. So we wanted to really launch it this evening at General Council and then we're gonna share it further um, to our pages. So I'm just going to check in with comms. Katie, we wanted to really, uh, it's, it's about a three minute or so uh, video that we wanted to share uh, with council uh, in our community first, uh, and then we'll be posting the link to our social media pages. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. We can't hear it, Katie. Okay, sorry, just give me one second. Chief, do you maybe want to circle back to me and just move on while I figure this out? Yep, no problem, Katie. Uh, is there any way that you still have to keep the, the share screen up? Okay, perfect. What we'll do, uh, Council, while Katie is figuring that piece out, is I'm going to go right into our delegation. So the Community Broadband Task Force, uh, the survey results. So that's our first delegation. And then our second delegation is the um, Canvas update. Uh, so with that being said, while Katie works on those pieces, uh, maybe I'll just check in with uh, Darren uh, and members of the uh, Broadband Task Force who will be leading that discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Chief. Uh, it's Darren. Uh, good evening, uh, community. Um, yeah, we wanted to come cycle back and provide um, the results of the survey that went out to, to all households and businesses uh, about... Uh, what, six weeks, six, seven weeks ago. And uh, we wanna just kind of provide uh, the results to community before they were more widely available. Um, and just to give some, some context, um, I'm the chair of the um, Connectivity Broadband Task Force, which is mandated by the elected council to look at um, bringing in into the territory options and, and possibilities for greater connectivity within the territory. As we know, we've struggled mightily with that, uh, particularly, uh, with COVID and the, the need to be able to have to work from home as well as study and, and go to school from home. 
so that was it was a crisis uh, intervention in, of, of many of many sorts and we did a, a very robust process in, in trying to work with all, not only local uh, service providers but also outside possible service providers uh, so i just wanted to just kind of give a bit of a background we've been in place just just under a year now it's hard to believe it's been that long but it's certainly been a lot of work and I just wanted to acknowledge the, the task force. We, we have some members on, on the call this evening. We have Melinda Parkner from, from Six Nations Polytechnic, Dave Vince uh, from Two, Row, uh, uh, Two Rivers, sorry, Two Rivers uh, Community Development Center and representing our community uh, business community. Uh, we have Mike Matur, who is our Director of Public Works. We have Dave George, he's our Director of, of IT for Six Nations Council. And we have comms is also attends those meetings. Uh, Katie's uh, previously was Candace Slickers and, and now Katie attends. Uh, we also of course have um, the chief and uh, Tammy attend uh, pretty regular. As obviously it's a pretty pretty big priority for the community. Uh, so what, what we wanted to do was just to come back because it, was a, it is a community survey, it is community information. Uh, and and as, a, as our accountability and transparency that we, we like to follow here within the community is we want to put, report those results back to you. We did share the results in a, in a meeting with, with all of the ISPs that were part of the exercise uh, to inform uh, future plans. Uh, so I guess the long and short of it is I will share, Chief, if it's okay, my screen uh, on the PowerPoint and just kind of walk through some of the highlights of the results. And just to let everybody know as well uh, out there that uh, now, now that it will be shared, it will also be available um, through our, our pages, our, our media, our website, et cetera, for people to, to uh, review, uh, consider, look at, and all that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm gonna go, go right ahead and do that. And um, I'm just gonna see if I did this right. <laughs> okay, you're gonna have to tell me if this shows up here. You see that? We're yes. good. We're gonna yes. go. Okay, we're gonna do a slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. That's good for everyone. Okay, we'll go. We'll go through that. And just a couple of caveats as well, or additional uh, context is uh, because we wanted to make sure that this was done um, objectively. Uh, we obviously um, were instrumental in putting together the questions uh, to be to give the sort of that, uh, results that we're looking for to inform decisions. Uh, for the community as well as the ISPs that were at the table wanting to provide services. Uh, but we provided all the raw data to a third party uh, consulting firm to do the tabulation just to make sure that it was independent and the results were uh, done that way with no, any, no, no biases attached to, it, to them. So it's really just the straight reporting of the findings. So one of the things that, and, and I just, the only thing I did was I provided some instructions on some cross tabulation, um, some kind of interesting findings that would be useful apart from the raw data tabulations for questions. This one is an important one, I think, because uh, some of you may recall in my consulting days, I did a lot of survey work, uh, leakage study and Haudenosaunee labor force study. And we wanna make sure that the sample that we, we did draw um, was representative of the, of the community as much as possible. We had a short time frame to turn this around. Uh, we had 314 completed surveys. There were a number of duplicates, but we only accepted one per household. Um, and from a statistical significance perspective, as long as you exceed 300, given our number of households, uh, the data is statistically significant. We, we wanted to test that even further and look at the representation geographically across the territory. So this chart kind of breaks down, just kind of shows you the, the level of responses of the, of the total data set and where they came from within the territory. So you can see we got responses from every road uh, area and geographic zone of the territory. And then we had, we also did another query um, and I'm gonna come back to these a little bit later if, if uh, we have some time, but uh, we also looked at ISP choice by different geographical area as well. And I think this is reflective um, of if there's a presence of the ISP in the market currently. I think it's important uh, just to understand that and particularly the ISPs were interested in this just in terms of their expansion of whatever kind of fiber optic network they would provide to the community in terms of their investment and priority of the build. So this makes sense. Uh, we had, there's, there's obviously uh, some First Nation customers along First Line, but also it would be their provider of choice regardless whether they are their current uh, subscriber or uh, customer of First Nations cable or not. Explorna and Rogers were evenly split as you can see. So that's an example of that. 
not going to go through all of these, but I'm just going to quickly flip through them, but you can kind of see what that kind of result gives you. It kind of helps with uh, planning and in terms of their, their investment in the fiber build. This one obviously is a uh, third line. Uh, there was more interest in Rogers. Uh, and this one, again, a, a bit more First Nations cable and Rogers pretty well split on fourth line. Just kind of gives you some examples of how the data can be used. So I'm just gonna flip through those very quickly and then we can go back to those if there's any additional interest in that. These are the key um, uh, survey results that we were looking to, to garner. Um, along as some reasons why uh, different providers of choice were, were selected. Um, one of the main questions was obviously, is every household, uh, do you support every household and business having access to fiber internet as soon as possible? So this is not, not a big surprise. Um, I think probably the reason that we say it is as soon as possible is we want to look at a solution that's going to give the service quicker, sooner rather than later. And how can that happen? Um, so that was why that question was raised. No surprises there. Um, do you want the option to choose your internet service provider? Again, very high, 98.4%. In other words, um, if there was, um, there, there was a preference to have more than one choice or at least a good choice, I think I could probably surmise from that. And do you support the need to build fiber throughout the entire community? Of course, no surprise there at 98.7%. This is a more, a more interesting uh, set of slides coming up now. Um, so we asked the question who their provider of choice would be. And if you can see the results there, um, Rogers and First Nations Cable pretty much even in terms of 39 and 38%. Exploring at about 19%. Bell at just under 2%. And some are just gonna wait for Starlink to, to become available, which I understand some people are in the queue, which may be available in 2022 from what I understand. So there you go in terms of the provider of choice. You can't read into too, this too much uh, you could maybe surmise that this represents a uh, not necessarily a current market share, but a future market share, should all these providers be present in the marketplace. So that's what this kind of uh, graphic kind of demonstrates. Some of the reasons um, that influence the decision for choosing an internet service provider, these are very, very interesting. Um, the number one reason, obviously, is uh, connection quality and support local. Uh, local is, is very important. Community wants to support business, uh, local business as much as possible, however that's possible. So I think that was a good, an important finding. Um, and that coupled with connect, connection quality, strength, stability, and speed, which we really haven't had a lot of that in the, in the territory to this point in time, uh, do, are, again, not a big surprise and make a lot of sense. And the others are, are pretty much uh, what you would consider. The next one would be happy with your current provider or happy with what they currently have. You know, obviously people have service now, whether it's through Bell, uh, First Nations Cable or ExploreNet, and you know, they're, they're happy with it. So they, they may not be switch, they may not switch provider. And that's an important point too, is regardless of what new services may be coming into the territory, people still have the choice to stay with whom they're with and they can choose to, to switch providers uh, if there's a better offering. So I think that that's a good thing is that we're trying to bring more choice to the community. Uh, why people chose Rogers. So we're going through the, in terms of the reasons why they picked different um, uh, service providers. Uh, and these are all at the table, uh, looking at ways to provide the service to the community. Uh, Rogers, number one reason was the connection quality aspect, as well as customer service. First Nations Cable, uh, again, no surprise, support local, they're local. They've been in business for some 30 years. They employ all First Nations community members. Uh, so it was 92% was what the reason why they would choose the First Nations Cable. Uh, and for ExploreNet, it was a bit more uh, evenly distributed. And this is where you're gonna see the evidence of current service. So they're happy with what they're already getting with the advent of the wireless towers. I know there's been some challenges there, but in some pockets of the community, I understand service has improved greatly and others not so much. So that's probably where this 40% um, is, is kind of coming through. Connection quality was, was the second and connection accessibility was the third reason. And that's it for in terms of the, the results. I think maybe what I can do, uh, Chief, is um, just provide a little bit of a way of an update in terms of what's happened since our meeting with the ISPs a couple of weeks ago. And I understand that um, there has been a meeting with Rogers and First Nations Cable to look at ways to work together 
Um, we don't know specifically the details of their business model, whether it's going to be a partnership or whether it's going to be um, uh, a reseller arrangement. Um, but I think the important point of that is that it will answer a lot of the, um, I guess the mandate for the task force was to try and get the service as quickly as possible. So First Nations Cable on their own might have not been able to do it as, as fast as, as Rogers could have done it. So I think they, they all took the results to heart and they've come to the table to talk about and explore what those options might be. And I know they've had one meeting and there's another meeting coming up. I don't know if it's this week, but perhaps next week. So there's, there's some good news that that's coming. Um, there, is a, there is an urgency obviously with the close of the, of the good weather to try and get something going. Um, and I know certainly on, from Rogers, they've indicated all along that they have made a commitment, weather permitting that they will work through the winter to try and get everything in, in place as much as quickly as possible. And I do, I also just got a word just yesterday that um, a, um, Explorna has also met with First Nations Cable. I don't know uh, what the outcome of that, that meeting was, um, but we are set to have an update, I believe on Thursday morning for that. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's no definitive results, but it, I believe it's very positive in the sense that community can look forward to fiber high-speed internet, um, perhaps not this fall, but certainly sometime early, hopefully early in, in the new year. And we can always provide updates in terms of how that rolls out. And, and then certainly I think there will be a lot of interest in that. So um, along with us providing updates, once, once we have more definitive information on the, on the schedule, I'm sure that they will look, be looking to make announcements, et cetera, along the way. So I'll stop there. Ask any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Darren, for walking us through those results and providing that, that update. Uh, if I could just ask you to uh, stop sharing your screen and I will look to any further questions or comments. There is a, a motion uh, that's on your agendas. I believe it's just, sorry, I'm just pulling this up. Uh, that the Six Nations of the Grand Rio Elected Council accept the presentation by the Community Broadband Task Force on the survey results as information. So looking to a mover in seconder to that motion, if there's no further questions or comments. I'll move. Wendy? Oh. I'll second. Sorry, the did, uh, Wendy, Wendy, were you uh, moving on the motion? I was. Okay, perfect. Moved by Wendy, second by Michelle. Are there any further questions or comments? I, I just have a comment. Sure. Helen? No. Oh, Hel Helen, you hit mute just at the last second. Jeez. I'm just glad to hear that uh, First Nations Cable and Rogers are sitting down and, and talking and trying to work together and as well as exploring that meeting with the First Nations, I think that's really good that they're all starting to, to talk and uh, hopefully something good can come out of it for First Nations Cable. I agree. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Helen. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any further questions or comments? <laughs> Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. I uh, just want to say thank you and Yawa to, to Darren and, and all the members on the, on the broadband task force for all of your work and commitment over this past year. I know it's been challenging work, and, but yet the commitment is still there. And I really just want to say uh, Nyawa to each of you uh, for contributing your time is such an important endeavor for this community. So just wanna say thank you. Um, the next uh, delegation that we have is uh, the Cannabis Commission, who's here to provide an update to community on the status of where cannabis is, as well as introducing uh, the new executive director. Um, so I, uh, I see Verna, good evening, Verna. Good evening, Nanta. Uh, what I'll do, hello there. What I'll do is pass it right over to Nanta uh, to maybe uh, at least uh, start us off and, and introduce Verna. And then Verna can maybe tell a little bit about yourself 
uh, and then we'll get in right into the update. Thanks, Chief. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, glad to see you all again. And um, hello, community. Nice to see you guys as well. Um, happy to um, introduce the Commission's new Executive Director. Her name is Verna George. She is a Six Nations Band member. Um, and I'm going to leave the actual introductions about her bio um, to her to go into. Um, and tonight, Verna is going to um, give the update for where we're at with the industry. Um, so we're, we're here as support people with our commission. Also want to give an opportunity to um, my co-commissioners to introduce themselves as well as the other members of my team. Um, just saying to say hi guys. Hi, it's Richard Johnson. I'm here. Um, I sit on the uh, Cannabis Commission. I don't think Drew's with us, is he? No, Drew's unavailable tonight. But we've got um, Wayne and Kim. Uh, I'm Wayne Greer. I have been uh, part of the project management team and providing business and strategic support since last April. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, yes, I'm having can. some audio issues this evening, but uh, good evening, everyone. It's nice to be here and looking forward to giving the update this evening. Thanks, Kim. Okay, perfect. And um, Verna. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Verna George, and I have been recently hired as the executive director for the Six Nations Cannabis Commission. Um, I have been a member of the Law Society of Ontario since 2007. Um, I am the youngest of nine children. Uh, I was born and raised in the Niagara region. Um, both my parents are from Six Nations. Um, um, I did my undergrad at Trent and then law school at Windsor. Uh, currently, I live at Kettle and Stony Point First Nation where I worked with this um, band administration for about 10 years in the negotiations department. Uh, I reside here with my husband and three kids who all go to university in London. Uh, I'm, I was so excited about this opportunity. Uh, very happy to be able to give back to my community. Um, Six Nations has supported my education journey all along and um, very happy to have this opportunity to give it back in this in this project because I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for the community. Um, with that being said, uh, I will give the update tonight and um, I'll get right into it. Um, the status of licensees. The commission is currently processing six license applications for cannabis producers. One production license has successfully been issued. Our industry regulatory consultants were incredibly impressed with this facility. The applicant invested a significant amount of time and resources. And as a result, the facility was constructed to meet and in some places exceed Health Canada standards. Can Delta performed the final inspection of this facility and said it is a shining star in the community's record to self-regulate. Our other production applicants are at different stages of construction, but are moving along in the process. Two in particular are quite close to being ready for inspections. The rest will be advanced to their final inspections in the coming weeks and months. On the retail side, we are processing five license applications for cannabis retailers. The licensing process for retail locations is much less involved than for, for production. So we expect to move those along quickly, depending on where the applicants are in the construction phase. Two of the five locations have nearly completed construction. Our tentative date for issuing our first retail license is November 1st. Import update. We are currently in conversations with cannabis producers and settling supply agreements to provide safe, regulated cannabis for licensed retailers with a tentative opening date of November 15th. 
Uh, the commission also passed a notice of order to specify the maximum number of retail sale, sales licenses any applicant can hold, either as an individual or as a partner, and it is set at five. Um, if you recall, this was in the Six Nations Cannabis Commission laws in, um, in Section 52. This is an order that came into effect on September 29, 2021. It will be displayed on our website to provide notice to the community in the near future. Communications. The Six Nations Cannabis Commission will be looking for a communication staff person. In the meantime, any inquiries that are directed to Chief and Council regarding the Cannabis Commission can be forwarded to myself. I can be reached at executive director at sncannabis.com or info at sncannabis.com, either one, and I can, I can um, take the inquiries or any questions that uh, the community or public may have. And that's it for this update. Okay, now, uh, now uh, um, Verna for providing that update and, and introducing yourself and also wanna say congratulations and welcome uh, to the Cannabis Commission. I uh, just want to also just check in, Nanta, if there's anything further on your end. I know this is, there's a quick, it was meant to be a quick update. I know there'll be many more updates to come as we progress. Uh, but nonetheless, again, you know, we all are, are on track to, um, to continuing moving forward in, uh, in this sector. So just wanted to check in and see if there's anything further on your end. Nope, that's everything. I think she did a great job. Thank you, Verna. Yes, phenomenal. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure as as we uh, progress, we'll be, we'll be seeing you much more, Verna, to provide <laughs> more updates in the coming weeks and months. So thank yes. you so much and congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, with You're that welcome. being said, uh, I, am, I will look to a motion just to accept uh, the verbal update as information at this time, moved by Audrey Seconder. Is there a seconder to accept Verna's verbal update as information. I will. Second by Carrie. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Just want to say again, thank you uh, to all of your team, Kim, Wayne, and all those, Verna, Richard, Nanta, who's all joined us this evening uh, and look forward to providing community even more further updates as we progress. So Niawa. Thank you. Good evening. Have a great evening, everyone. Okay, just before I go into the uh, adoption of the General Council minutes, I just wanted to check in with Katie on our comms to see if we've worked out any technical difficulties. I think so. Um, my apologies, Council. So we'll try this one more time. And if you have problems seeing or hearing anything, let me know. Let me just give me a moment. Okay, are you able to see that? Yes. Okay, let me know if you have issues with the sound. I am here to honor the people that were in residential schools and the people that did not survive residential schools. We've come together today to build this heart. Uh, to show and look to, uh, you know, how important uh, this day is and how important the next days are going to be and where we go from here. That's exactly why we're here today is to honor our survivors, to honor our children who never made it home, but to also honor each and every single one of us here. You know, we have been through so much as a people. And it's so inspiring to see the perseverance and the resilience that we have as a people. We 
have children who matter now. As much as you know, we've been going through the difficult times, and you know, they, they, these have been really heavy and, and dark conversations. And these conversations are tough. You know, I've been asked uh, multiple times today how I felt of this day and what that means. You know, there's a lot of mixed emotions, and I'm sure a lot of our community members who are here today can attest to just that. I'm here uh, thinking about my mom, who was at, attended the residential school. She was there in the early 40s, I guess. She attended for seven years. And two of my aunts are with me today as well, and they both attended residential school. So just paying uh, respect to their memories. And um, I'm thinking it's a, an excellent way to bring awareness to our whole nation. We can't have reconciliation if we don't know the truths. We know the truths based upon the survivors' stories. They've been telling us for years and years and years. In deaf school, she was also a victim because of her native language. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> and she's happy to be alive today. And our grandmother was also in the residential school. Our survivors have endured so much. They've endured so much in their lives. And to be able to then work alongside of them and for them to guide us and continue to work with us, it is so inspiring to me. This is gonna be such a, a, a tough journey as we now get into the beginning stages of the search. But this is something that has to happen and get done. I think justice comes in many forms. Justice is when we all can say we have access to clean drinking water. Justice is for when we have our young people be able to have a healthy environment of a school. Justice is being able to do these important things so that we can progress and move our communities forward. It's tough and dark, and these are hard conversations. We still have to see the beauty of what this all means as well for our people. And what I see is I see our people coming together for the cause of honoring every child and getting every child back home. We know survivors are saying now, they want to start and begin now. How we come together is exactly what is so beautiful about our people. It's a healing pathway forward. What that looks like is gonna be determined by each of all of us. And I know that we have to continue to support each other. We have to continue to support our young people. Our young people are coming up into leadership roles. They've been leaders. It's time to pass the torch, to teach them, to uplift them, to bring them to where we have to look to see what they want to achieve in their lives. All our children matter. They've always mattered and they matter now even more so. Okay, thank you uh, Niala so much, uh, Katie, for, for sharing that video. Uh, we wanted to, our goal, really just some context behind that is uh, when we hired the videographer, we know like with COVID and our, our color status and what we were in, you know, not a lot of our community members were able to join uh, and be there. However, we wanted to still share the experience. Uh, and so really just want to say Niala to Pink's production as well for helping us, uh, you know, achieve this, this video. Uh, and we really wanted to launch it, uh, you know, last as soon as it was complete. So uh, today, this evening, was our official launch of that video. We promised this to community at the event, uh, and really just wanted to share that tonight uh, with each of you uh, uh, here at council, as well as uh, those of you uh, listening live on Facebook. We're also going to follow up uh, with uh, the video itself being posted to our social media pages. So, with that, just want to say now to each and every one who was involved. Uh, and able to make that video uh, so um, so moving. So appreciate that. 
Moving uh, into our next agenda item is our general council minutes uh, of September 28th. Moved, moved by Michelle, seconded by Sherry Lynn. Is there any um, questions or comments, Michelle? I didn't. I didn't see them. Am I the only one that doesn't have them in the job box? Oh, my apologies. Sorry, sorry. I wasn't moving. To... I was asking where they were. Do we need to defer this? <laughs> sorry, Michelle. My apologies. Is uh. Just want to confirm, is that, did anyone else have any issues? Well, Tammy, is, can you confirm if the minutes are in the Dropbox? I can't confirm. So I think we should bring the, this item back for the next agenda. Sorry. Okay, my, my apologies. Sorry, Council. I, I am not working off of Dropbox this evening as well. So I, I, I didn't know that. Um, so Shirley, we'll look to Shirley again, just as she is on bereavement. Um, and we'll look to bring this item back at our next general council meeting for the minutes. Uh, I do want to then shift into uh, any political updates. I'll just pause here and look to Christopher just to provide any further uh, community political updates. Chief. Um, yeah, just a brief update. Uh, as most people are aware, the prime minister has announced that he will be um, publicizing his new cabinet, making his cabinet shuffle sometime in the month of October. So we don't know exactly when that will happen, but um, could happen anytime. Um, as soon as that happens, we're going to be, uh, since the election, we've already reached out to some of our, our contacts in uh, the federal government, um, just to congratulate them and, uh, and to reconnect. As soon as the cabinet shuffle has been done, though, we're going to be following up, um, depending on where uh, different ministries uh, land. Um, we've also reached out to uh, the new member of parliament for Brantford Brant in which Six Nations is situated, uh, Larry Brock, and uh, we're going to be meeting with him in the near future as well uh, to follow up on the, uh, the very productive conversation that uh, council had with the candidates on our Meet the Candidates night, um, uh, particularly on the excise tax issue, which is obviously of significant importance to the community and to council. Uh, and on which uh, Mr. Brock uh, expressed uh, uh, his sentiments during that meeting uh, and said a number of very interesting and promising things. So we're going to be following up on that with him uh, in the next couple of weeks as well uh, in a meeting. And uh, we, uh, we have also got letters sent out from the chief to the prime minister and to uh, Minister Miller and Minister Bennett. Um, just to reconnect after the election as well and to congratulate them on, on their, uh, their election win. Um, and again, we'll be following up on all of that once the new cabinet is announced and, uh, and then pursuing a number of meetings to which we'll be inviting uh, councillors as well. Thank you. Christopher, did you want to just maybe even I mentioned, I know we're in the works, but uh, just what we've talked about in relation to lobby days, uh, just that will be once that the, the, shuffle, the cabinet is secured and so forth and what all we'll be working on in terms of those pieces. Yeah, so we'll be having a series of meetings that we're setting up to which we'll be inviting the Six Nations of the Grand River uh, Department heads and directors, as well as any and all counselors who are interested in any given file with the appropriate ministers. Uh, and we'll be pursuing a, uh, a roster, uh, a schedule of meetings, if you will. Um, and that, uh, that uh, remains to be settled. But what we'll be doing is we'll be um, in conversation with different counselors and different directors determining where our priority meetings are and setting up uh, meetings probably on three or four separate days uh, over the, the coming weeks um, so that counselors and uh, directors have a chance to raise uh, priority issues with the relevant ministers. So we'll advise uh, on those as soon as those, uh, those get locked in in terms of when we're gonna pitch those meetings. Uh, and of course, uh, as soon as the meetings are arranged. Perfect. Thank you for touching on that. So we know there's many items uh, and issues that we need to we need to touch on and, and further confirm. Obviously, number one, even being uh, the meeting confirmed with Miller or who, whomever is in that role uh, in relation to Gawaneal School. Uh, I know there's been many. Uh, Councillor Helen has brought up issues in relation to Jordan's principal. Uh, we've also got that letter sent out, I believe, as well, just in follow up to those pieces. So there's a number of pieces that we're working on in the office and we'll look to uh, advise and to update further once all are secured uh, and meeting dates are scheduled. 
so just wanted to maybe pause and see if there's any further questions or comments for Christopher or myself. Again, just quick verbal uh, update. Okay, that being said, I see her here. No, I'll move on to the next. Uh, thank you for that, for providing that quick update, Christopher. Uh, the next piece then is appointments to external committees. Uh, the first one uh, is in relation to the First Nations Delivery Credit Working Group, which there's a briefing note attached in your Dropbox. Just want to reconfirm with Tammy on the line. Tammy was there. This was the the other one was the Border Alliance. Is that correct? Yes. The 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 first briefing note you mentioned it was actually from the Chiefs of Ontario, where they were informing Six Nations or Council that that they're striking up this committee, and so we they were asking for appointment names for appointments to be part of that committee, and. Then, um, the Border Alliance one actually doesn't need to happen tonight because it was initially um, going to be an in-person, but now it's going to be a virtual. So, so there's no VCR required for travel. Okay, just uh, just on that note, and thanks for that, Tammy. Um, I'll uh, I'd like to suggest if I could put my name forward on that working group, the delivery credit working group at this time, just as we shift into the transition of, of where we're going uh, with potential of and I'll further update on these in terms of transitioning to portfolios. So I know there's there's other external committees and so forth, but uh, I'd like to sit at that table for now just to provide updates to council, um, and so that we're still uh, being kept in the loop on information as well. So if there's, if there's, is there any opposition uh, to myself to sit at that uh, working group at this time? Thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Tammy, so we can just advise Chiefs of Ontario that we'll, uh, we'll continue with my name at this time. Uh, in the meantime, we'll look to the transition period as well once we start to shift over and we have a further update on that as well. Nathan? Okay, do you want to name an alternate? Yeah, that's actually what's gonna be my next, my next point as well. Is there is there a counselor who's interested uh, to be an alternate on this table? I see Nathan has his hand up. No, I, I've already done, done this one, so I don't want to do it again. I did the original okay. notifications. Okay, I see Helen. Helen's got her hand okay. up. Helen, are you looking to be an alternate? Okay, perfect. Sorry, back over to you, Nate. Yeah, just yes. just by way yes, of. I am. Okay, just by you, way of. Just by way of background information, I think the Chiefs of Ontario is jumping into this without doing their due diligence. Um, they're taking the word of the minister as, as this is not in the purview of Hydro One. Hydro One doesn't regulate itself. It's, it's, a, it's the utility provider. So the negotiations for this particular item have to happen with the Ontario Energy Board, who is the regulator. It's, it's who we did the original negotiations with. Uh, and also, um, it would be good to pull out um, OAB provided Chiefs of Ontario with a list of concessions in terms of when they were ready to start these negotiations back up as it relates to band owned buildings and the businesses. So they'll need to pull that document. Um, but from what I, you know, the original information by way of the briefing note, the letter, um, I think uh, I think Chiefs of Ontario need to do some more due diligence to get the correct information out to the communities on this. Um, just yeah, so that. It, I, oops, sorry, sorry for that, Nathan. I, I was I was going to agree, and maybe we can touch base as well, just further prior to um, or furthering uh, these concerns that I can bring to that table as well. So really appreciate that, uh, Sherry Lynn. No, I was just going to say for an alternate, that was all. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks for that, Sherilyn. Uh, Wendy. Oh, sorry, Wendy, uh, you're on mute. I did hit the button, but can we get more information as well on um, if the meetings do transpire, then who's actually at the table, whether it be yeah. Hydro One, whether it be others, the regulator, whomever, but who's actually sitting there? Because um, it's fine to always yeah. put, put a, you know, a company, but depending who we're meeting with, it may not matter much. Agreed. Yes. Yeah. So I'll I'll go to the initial and provide an update for the back to full council, and then we'll go from there as to what uh, we see best as next steps. Uh, okay.
thank you for that council. So we'll look to uh, myself and Helen as the alternate. Can I actually just get that into a motion form? Is there a, is there a mover moved by Sherry Lynn, seconder? Second by Nathan. Are there any further uh, questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none motion is carried. Uh, that leaves us into scheduling. Uh, so obviously we have a general council live right now. Tomorrow morning we're building an infrastructure. We also have a water connection strategy meeting on Friday, uh, leading into the following week for general finance. All of these, mind you, uh, are, are live streamed on Zoom um, into general council the following day and then corporate emergency services. I know there's many other meetings in between. Uh, this is just for the community uh, information on the live streamed ones and our general councils and general finances. Uh, that being said, I'll move right into uh, new business. Over to you, Nathan, on flooding and ditching. Yeah, um, in terms of the specifics on, on the actual community um, complaint, I'll, I'll turn that over to Michelle, but I'll give some high level comments as it relates to um, the flooding strategy at Six Nations, um, the work that's been done in the past, and, and uh, some of the, the work as it relates to, um, I believe it was referred to in the past as the, the Six Nations Water Master Plan. Um, a number of um, these studies were done in the past and came up with good solid recommendations um, on uh, a number of issues um, that kind of need to be brought back up to the forefront so that we can look at this from a strategic standpoint, make sure the proper investments are there um, and, and follow through on, I guess. Uh, once, you know, we, we do spend money to get these studies done and, and these master plans completed, but uh, I think we have to stay on them in terms of ensuring that cross departments are, are uh, also adhering or not adhering, but. Uh, following up with a number of these um, recommendations uh, because what's happening and what we're seeing on the ground and, and Michelle can speak to this more is, is um, these are, are starting to mitigate into larger, bigger problems where it's, it's actually starting to cost the homeowner a um, significant amount of money. And, and it's, it's happening across the territory because of these um, uh, because we're not following these recommendations that are put in these studies um, as, as it relates to flooding and drainage. It, it's almost like we, we, you know, mitigate one problem, but then, you know, that drainage and that flood goes uh, into the next kind of uh, line or goes into the next watershed. So um, I guess from a, a high level standpoint, um, today at our environment committee, we, we got a, a good history lesson from Clint King. Uh, who provided us really good information on these past studies and, and what was done and, and also what wasn't done. Um, and um, before I turn it over to Michelle, I'm, I'm thinking that we need again to kind of look and, and take a strategic approach very similar to how we have in the past on ensuring that um, a lot of these studies are, are refreshed, uh, updated, and, and we can put the, the resources to them to ensure that they're followed up on. Uh, but again, like I said, there's a very real issue happening that we, we also need to discuss, and I'll, I'll turn that over to Michelle to kind of give the, the, the broad strokes on that particular issue as well. Thanks, Nathan. And so over the weekend, um, a few of us have been um, working with community members because there's um, flooding that's happening within with the rain that we've had. And so as Nathan said, and so diplomatically, um, I'm, I'm going to try and be as diplomatic as Nathan is this has been a longstanding issue even before this council. And so today what I thought, you know, we brought it forward as, as a community concern and I thought it would have been addressed at our committee. Unfortunately, it seems that um, we hit a roadblock in trying to assist community members. And so for me, I know this has come up at, being, at building an infrastructure. Um, what is, these are government um, ditches that have been an ongoing issue. We brought it up last summer and asked for a plan. How many do we have? What's the lay of the land? Because I don't even know on, until somebody comes forward and complains. And so I guess today we you know, want a solution 
um, the homeowners are willing to even find the people to do the work, can council pay for it? And, uh, you know, uh, environment doesn't have funds. Um, where do we go from here? And I know we're in the weeds now, but um, this is ongoing. Issues arise and we don't have any movement on them. So it's, it's so frustrating. And this is why I wanted to bring it forward this evening because we need to follow through. When we say we're doing something, we have to finish it. Because now what I see is a health and safety issue for community members. What could have been $2,500? may now be $100,000. So I, I mean, uh, that's the way I look at it. Um, and so I'm just looking for, I guess, support from full council on how do we move forward when um, initiatives should be happening. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Nathan and Michelle for bringing this item forward. I do want to look to, I do, I do see, I believe our director of public works on as well. Um, perhaps maybe he would like to shed some some uh, comments and light on this. I, but before that, I see uh, Wendy has her hand up. Thanks, Mark. Can, just asking Michelle and Nathan, can you be a little bit more precise? What exactly are we talking about here? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to decipher a little bit. So I'm guessing it's the ditches are flooding and that's causing backup into homeowners properties. Is that what we're talking about? Um, it is, and actually, can I ask Rod to speak to it because he has the history on it, and, and he's done the discussions with Norfolk Six Nations. Um, well, 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 just in a nutshell, right, so that we can, yeah, address. Rod, what can you give him a minute issue? overview on the issue and the clay and all of that? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Rod. Are you uh, are you available to? Um to provide some background to this? Further background that is. Oh, sorry, I think he might be having some technical issues. But this, this was discussed and brought up at the Environment Task Force, correct? I know I, I joined a little later today. Just wanna confirm with Nathan and Michelle. Oh, sorry, I see Helen has her hand up. <laughs> no, I just wanted to, like, Michelle's right. This These government ditches, which is what the government made, not us, um, is a long-standing issue. And we've had, every year we get complaints. We've got complaint 20 years, we've been getting complaints about the government ditches flooding and the government ditches being all brought in with weeds and trees and whatever and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and we've never dealt, council never dealt with the government ditches because they were the government ditches. And we've never accepted responsibility to get after them and cleaning them. Um, you want to start helping homeowners and property owners. And remember these ditches go all through the reserve. Well, it could be quite costly if that's what we start doing. I think we really need, it's really important to go back and look at the history of these government ditches. And that's where we need to start. With the new council, we need to start going back into the history and work it up towards, because we've never, we've also never ever accepted responsibility for um, because like I said, they do go all through the reserve. So that involves a lot of properties and a lot of homeowners. Um, so that's just something we need to look into, but I really think we need to go back into the history and look at what they're, where they started from, why they're there, what they did it for, and then figure out what can we do. Um, we want to start helping homeowners pay for it. The property owners, and that's what I'm telling you, they go through the whole reserve. That's a lot of homeowners and that's a lot of property owners. If you're gonna help one, then you have to help them all. So it Mark, it's very, very costly. Mark, it's Hazel. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Hazel. Or thank you, Helen. Uh, we need to go back and look at the history of this whole thing. 
Yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Helen. Uh, I do have a number of hands up. I'm going to first begin with Nathan over to Wendy and then Hazel. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, thanks, Chief, and thanks for that, Helen, because that's exactly what we did today was to start to go over that history. That's why I mentioned, Helen, that uh, we brought in Tim King to have this discussion, and we're digging deep on, on this to look at what was done and what hasn't been done. And, and I think, you know, in terms of the, um, the government dishes aspect of things, I think that's the, why we wanted to bring it to council, to, because we need to have that discussion, um, because you're absolutely right, this goes across the, the territory. Um, but at the, at the same time, there's, there's a number of issues um, in terms of these ditches where we might get to the point where it's going to cost us more than to mitigate the issues down the road than it's costing us now. Um, one thing with water is we all know it's very powerful and it can destroy things. And, and that's where my worry is with when we looked at all of the studies that have been done. Um, and as well as the, the work that has been done in the past and what hasn't been done in the past. Um, so you're right in terms of this is a costly in, endeavor now, but it could, and, and I feel it will, cost us a lot more down the road if we don't do anything. Um, so there's, there's that aspect. And, and that's the discussion I wanna have with my colleagues here at council. Um, to Wendy's earlier question, um, yes, it, it does have to do with, uh, you know, a certain um, uh, area where there's a number of technical issues around it, but essentially this is a, a government ditch that now needs to be dug, from my understanding, is, is eight feet uh, deep to, to kind of clear that, that kind of drainage in that natural area. And because, as we all know, it's clay, um, unfortunately, water doesn't absorb into clay. Um, uh, in, in, in the most basic terms. So that's where we have to come up and, and this is where the engineers need to come in. The civil engineers need to come in in terms of that drainage and, and how to do that property. Um, but I, I guess it's, it's that question and going back to Helen's question, it's the cost of doing nothing versus the cost of doing something. And, and that's the discussion I wanna have because um, you know when you, when you look at the history as Helen's pointing out, you see exactly the studies that have been done and, and where this could have been mitigated years ago. Um, you kind of see that in the work. So that's where I'm highlighting it. Like it has to stop at some point and, and we have to step in uh, because I, I feel uh, if we continue down the path of doing nothing, it's gonna cost us millions down the road. Like we're, we're talking roads being washed out here. Like that's, that's where we're at in this particular kind of um, uh, work. So uh, I'll just, I'll leave my comments there, but uh, I think, I think we got to look at this issue a little bit more deeply um, and, uh, you know, have a good discussion about this. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Again, uh, just looking, going down the list of speakers I have, I recognize Sherry Lynn as well, uh, but for now, uh, I'll look to pass the floor to Wendy. Yeah, and Nathan covered most of it, but I mean, I'm I'm like a broken record on liability and risk assessment. So I, I agree with Nathan. What's the cost of doing nothing? I mean, it's fine to say that it's government dish, ditches and there was no responsibility, but if it exists on the territory, I mean, where's the liability? And if it starts to impact homeowners because of not doing anything, I mean, we have to look at all of those factors and, you know, may, we may have to have a strategic plan in place to do some action while doing something else um, and expedite that along if it's impacting homes. Because otherwise, I mean, again, the risk assessment and liability, we could be on the hook for the homes as well as the roads. So, and, you know, we wouldn't want anybody to be harmed in this process either. Something happened along the way, so. Okay, I, I agree. Uh, and thanks I for that, in, Wendy. Could I be oh, in line, Mark? Yeah. It's Melba. Yeah, I hear you, Melba. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker I have is Hazel. Yeah, I just like the historical background on these government dishes. <clears throat> if you're saying that uh, it's not our responsibility, who in the first place provided authorization for the government ditches to happen throughout the reserve? 
who who gave their authorization for the government to do it? I not. Yeah, I did it. Like everything else on the reserve, the reserve has a say in what happens here. So I guess I'm having a difficult time trying to understand why at that time um, was nothing done. Um, you mean they just said we're going to do this and they did it and nobody, um, I guess, I don't know. I just see council as having, should have had authority to uh, demand what they wanted and to have follow up as far as taking care of the ditches throughout the, the year since they were put in. Thank you. Thanks, Hazel. Yeah, that's that's part of my questions as well as in terms of like the solutions. Do we then now strategize and look to, you know, adding this to our, our political advocacy uh, priorities in terms of, you know, uh, advocating for more funding specifically for government ditches? Have we received funding in the past? If so, how much? Things like that. So I'm, I'm going to check in with our, our director of public works as well at some point, but just continuing to go down the list. Carrie Lynn. Yeah, for sure. We need a strategy or a plan because, again, like what Michelle's saying, um, I, I'm also dealing with community members also um, who's been waiting for weeks and it's still raining <laughs> and still nothing's been done to, to assist. So, you know, we need a strategic plan, but also, too, maybe a framed as emergency response case by case because something needs to happen because. Like I said, rain is still happening and the, the water keeps creeping up or it's filling in these basements. So, and we're gonna sit here and invest in some, invest in them so we don't have to deal with this later on or we're gonna sit here and still do nothing. Agreed, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Sherilyn, for your comments as well. Um, Melba? Yeah, sorry about the disturbance there. I, I got all choked up, I'm afraid. So I had to stay off of uh, Zoom for a little while. Anyhow, concerning government ditches, when I was a kid, these th the, the government ditch that we had on our 40-acre property was useful. I'm not sure where all the government ditches are now, but I'm only familiar with what we had. We had it back in a field way back where it was very useful for animals and for our garden. So... I'm assuming they put it in because it was needed at the time. I'm not sure if anyone knows that, but that's what I've been listening to so far, but I missed quite a bit of it. Uh, it it's not being said that that was useful way back then, but now it may not be necessary. But I do, um, uh, concerning flooding, I did get a report too that a lady lost a lot of her her furniture in a basement as a result of the flooding. So does anybody know the answers that it was very useful years ago? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Mel. I see Helen, uh, it looks like to a response and I'll shift over to Darren. Yeah, I just want to say too, part of the, res the, the responsibility was to the farmer I guess the farmer or the landowner, because it was mostly farmlands. It didn't really put too many by houses, but they weren't by houses, but they're by houses now because people build their houses anywhere. Part of the responsibility of the landowner was to keep those ditches clear. And they never did that. A lot of them didn't do that. So that's why they grew it over with trees and weeds and all kinds of stuff. So the water isn't draining the way it's supposed to be draining. It, that's why I said I think it's really important to go really back to that long history. I, I'm I'm not I don't even know for sure myself why they did them in the first place. I remember hearing something about it, but I can't recall what I heard. But I just know the landowner was supposed to be keeping the ditches clear, and they never did that because in their minds it wasn't their ditch; it was the government ditch. The government was supposed to keep it clear. So everything you know, people just kept. Government never did nothing. The landowner didn't do nothing. So here we are today. These ditches are all grown in and they're running over and they're flooding and they're, people build their houses wherever they want nowadays. 
they could be building their house right in front of these ditches and because we have no regulations or environmental anything about where you can build a house. So all of these issues have accumulated over the years. Um, and we're having what we have today. So it kind of goes, I guess it's everybody's responsibility. I shouldn't have said it wasn't council's responsibility. It was the whole community's responsibility to look after these ditches. But why they put them there in the first place is Hazel asked. I can't recall what that was for. But we need to go to the government for funding to look after them. I don't think we've ever done that. Now, I don't recall council ever doing that in my years here, going to the government and say, you got to give us money to fix these ditches because you're the ones put them there. So that might be something we want to do when we, we think of go out lobbying and whatever. Or I, I really think it's important to get, and like Nathan said, it, to get a really clear picture of what happened you know, why they're there, what happened, and blah, 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 and then figure out from there what we can do. But I really think we need to lobby government for money to fix them. Because I know they're starting to flood people's houses, like right close to their property is their house. So it's just, and you're right, I guess, because nothing was done back in the, the 60s and the 50s. Or I think they were put there in the 50s. Nothing was done when they started not working the way they were supposed to work. And you're right, like I think it's Wendy said the 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 lack of looking after them has just accumulated over the years. And here we are today trying to figure out what we can do with them. Agreed. Yeah. So looking to that that really that strategic plan and what we're discussing. And yeah, obviously we know, you know, a lobbying and, and looking for the advocate or further advocating for the funds for these, I think is the most important piece as well. Uh, again, want to continue down on the speaking list. Darren, I had Darren next, uh, and then Wendy and Audrey. Darren, you have the floor. If yeah, sure, I'll, I'll just be quick. There's a few others that want to chime in, so I'll just be quick. A good discussion. I think there's a couple of things here, and I, I think it's not unknown. I mean, everybody's not talking the same language. We have acute issues because of the year of rain this year. It's like it, it's really sh exposing our flood-prone areas within the community. Um, and, you know, and, and just a bit of background on, this, on one of the situations that I'm aware of is the homeowner did fill in a ditch, which did cause a bit of flooding as well. So it, it's kind of case specific. And I agree with Helen, there is there is a co-responsibility. There's, you know, do we, the homeowners have insurance for flooding? Most people don't because this is not typically a flood prone area. We are on a reserve, it's clay based. Most reserves in Canada are, are in really poor drainage areas. Uh, for on, for a reason <laughs> so anyway um so yes i totally agree with the political strategy i think that it's a two-pronged approach we may want to consider an emergency like the idea of an emergency fund we talked about that at sat today uh for a number of reasons number of number of uses um but that's going to take a council decision if we look at some of the you know the FO, fnlp dollars whatever we have left maybe we set aside some of that but we have to run up an account that liability piece and we, make, and we do a position paper and we put the government on notice, but we make sure we, we look at the, the, the extent of the cost and we look at some mitigation measures in the short term. But, you know, I mean, that's gonna take some work still, but I'm just saying it's a two prong approach. Oh yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that two prong approach, Darren. I think it's something that, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to get on rather quickly. I know the environment, the task force had at great lengths this afternoon. Uh, conversations on this so really looking to solutions and how we can further assist our, our community members in this overall issue uh wendy and then audrey and carrie yeah so i i mean i think we're all saying the same thing so i don't know if the environmental uh task force has a recommendation that they wanted to bring forward but i think we really need to establish that plan i think we need to have the facts so if there is some history that we know let's just map it out what are we talking about? When were they built? Um, you know, a map of the reserve with approximately where these ditches are. We can do that quite simply. What are the impacts to the homeowners? What's the degree of impact? Are we talking about totally flooded out basements? Are we talking about, you know, the lands around the homes? Are we talking about the roadway? So what, what are the facts that we know on, on the surface? You know, those conditions so impacting how many homes are they impacting? Listing out all of those things, just the information that we know. 
right? Those that, that existing. Um, based on that, then that will allow us to devise a plan in terms of what's needed. Before we jump in and just say, we need to bring in engineers, what's the information that we know now? Once we have that, then we can figure out that priority plan. Maybe it is you know, a certain amount in terms of that emergency response. Maybe it's a, another avenue with that plan and what we can do, but we kind of need to see that picture so that we can actually do something and, and do some action to it right away. And I would think we have, it sounds like we have all of the information. It's just a matter of sitting down and putting pen to paper so that we can all see it. That's my recommendation. Agreed. Agreed. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree, uh, Wendy, with your comments. Audrey uh, and then Carrie. Uh, yes. Just wanted to say that um, another part that we need to look at too is from housing. I think that housing has to have an affordable person who's skilled in at letting the homeowner know what the best placement for the houses, the laneway, the sump, uh, the, sorry, the cistern, the field bed. All of those things that they have to look at the natural lay of the land to find out where they go. So that you, you're not building your hand, your home in a floodplain. You're not putting your driveway in a place where it floods out every year in the spring and you're building in the fall and you don't know that. So I think that's something we also should be putting into our plan. And I think that we should be looking into the uh, heavy duty sump pumps. I think that can be uh, maybe switched out for some of these ones that uh, can't handle the continuous flood. We should also be looking at try to maybe try to offset having generators for people whose basements do flood on a regular basis to help them out. And I also don't know that Mike has a plan for water that he presented to at BNI and he presented at council. So he's dealing with it. He has a big plan, but maybe he has to incorporate all this other stuff. And I think he's a key player in solving all these uh, water problems. So yeah. Well, Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Audrey, for your comments and suggestions as well. Um, looking to, you know, adding these notes and, and coming up with that, that overall strategic plan. Uh, I have Carrie and then Nathan next. Carrie, you have the floor. Yeah, I think we're all saying the, basically the same thing. I, I think that we maybe check our archives to see if there's any paperwork about how these government ditches got started. And, and, and I think there's a, there's a group that was working with Mike on the Boston Creek and the Mackenzie Creek. And I think they had mapped out all the, the low points, like all the floodplains on the territory. I, I think that would be probably good information going forward, but Obviously, it can't help the ones that are already built now. But but I think the more information we get, and then go back to the, to the government to find out what we can get. Agreed. Yes, we're all speaking the same language and talking uh, the same solution. So it's it's nice to hear, Nathan. Yeah. Um, just just in response. So just. So Carrie knows the, the when I say the study that we looked at today, it was that study that Carrie just referenced. So that's the work that Clint Day or sorry Clint King did. Uh, Rod starting to pick up a lot of that work, and and that's why it was brought to uh, the committee this morning in terms of looking at what what's been done in the past. And and keep in mind it's 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 a snapshot for us, right? So like Helen said, we have to dive deep into um, into the history on on this particular file. So I think that's important. And um, also when we sit as the environment task force, we have housing there, um, we have lands and membership there. Uh, housing does a lot of that work that, that Audrey um, provided. Um, the, the issue isn't the fact that communities don't wanna build on a, on a floodplain. The issue is we have a shortage of, of land. So they have no choice. So that's the issue. That's where we have to drill down and, and really look at what those issues are. Um, because the other thing too that Rod was working on was was also to um, also complement the the work of housing from an environmental standpoint and providing you know once you get and start building a house um, we offer you here's a checklist in terms of things you have to look at uh, so that's some of the other pieces going forward 
But I, I really like how Wendy kind of laid it out in terms of looking at the information and, and having that as that starting point so that we can get that plan in place for this because, you know, time's of the essence. Uh, I look at the weather report, we got three more days of rain coming. Um, so let's look at, you know, some, some and, it, and it has to come down to an emergency kind of response. You know, I, I get it that uh, from the standpoint, we, we might be letting a, a homeowner or a CP owner off the hook for not paying for something. But I, I think we have to deal with the issue on an emergency basis. And then, you know, very much like Jordan's principle, um, to use that principle, let's, let's pay for it first and, and get it mitigated so that the issue isn't there anymore and then you know worry about who pays for it after uh, i know it's not the best solution for this particular issue right now but it is it is a solution so um i'm just offering that up um for that kind of emergency standpoint because uh you know i i got a call and, and we have folks that have to canoe into their their house uh, like that's happening on our territory right now um so there, there's a lot of issues that I think we need to kind of look at and, and uh, take it from the principle of let's fix the problem first, uh, because it is impacting a lot of folks, um, but also um, be very, very uh, particular and very cognizant of, of the responsibility, because I think you're right. I think it's all of our responsibility. Council's going to pay a, play a role, but um, moving forward, I don't want to set precedent, but I also want to start getting some of these issues mitigated sooner rather than later. So um, I, I think, again, if I'm going to provide a recommendation, I think we do an emergency response to, you know, the complaints that we're getting now, deal with those, uh, and, and at the same time, uh, take that strategic approach and develop that strategy going forward, lobbying, getting folks, uh, government committed to this and, and getting this resolved. I, I, uh, I agree and thank you with that, uh, Nathan. Uh, I just wanted to check in with our Director of Public Works, uh, Mike Mike Montour, just to maybe shed any of his, uh, his comments or our thoughts on this issue. Great discussion. Um, you guys hit a lot of key points. Uh, just just some, some information that I have that might be helpful is that the, uh, the government ditches, as they call them, uh, were built in the late 70s or in early 80s as part of a, a funding program from the feds. Um, they were mainly focused around uh, enhancing crop yield for farmers, so they weren't necessarily for these, for how we've developed since. Um, yep, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, the the different reports that were done. So we did a uh, Mackenzie Creek flood damage survey, as well as a Boston Rogers Creek, which covers our uh, the west and eastern portions of the territory here. Um, but the main barrier, I guess, to completing a lot of work has been private property access. So uh, yeah, I've I've heard I've heard housing, but one thing to keep in mind is that um, not everyone goes through housing for a housing loan, and what if they don't, um, there's really really nothing we can do to uh, encourage them not to you know uh, deviate or or fill in these these ditches because there are impacts uh, to neighbors. So there's there's a bit of a a bit of work to do on that end, and I know the environment committee or environment tax task force and Rod's been a, a great asset there. So we're, we're working towards, I guess, a fulsome solution, but as far as the physical works and, uh, you know, Councillor Wendelin's suggestion, I can arrange for the, the authors of those reports to come and do a presentation to Council or even the BNI committee, uh, if you like, and then we can go from there. But uh, th that's, that's kind of the only information I have that's missing from the conversation so far. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, for providing uh, your comments to, to this issue. Uh, I just want to look to next steps. There's been some really great suggestions in terms of uh, next steps and where do we go from this point. Uh, I'm wondering, Can in I... a sense, if we, if, oh, sorry, I hear Melba and yeah. I see Michelle. I'll check in with Melba first and go over to Michelle. Oh, I got one comment. Yeah, I'm glad, uh, yeah, I'm glad that Mike mentioned, you know, that uh, possibly uh, it was for enhancing crops and fields for farmers. I was going to suggest that, uh, consultation needs to be with farmers because it sounds like we're talking and more harm than good here uh, concerning the flooding and, and the damages that it's doing to fields and, and people's homes and other areas of uh, uh, using a canoe and things like this. But 
I would think that farmers used this years ago. That's what I would guess. And also, it wasn't just for the land and what they were doing, but also animals. Where would they get the water? We didn't have rain like we do nowadays, overabundance, really. So I would think that we should look at uh, beyond 70s and 80s, because when I was a kid, those were words that were used, and we did have a government ditch. So it's way beyond the 70s and 80s, and possibly um, that's what was happening in the 70s and 80s, along with before, way before, many years before. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Melba. I do want to start to shift into next steps and where we go from this point. But before that, I'll just look to our last two speakers. I have Michelle and then mm -hmm. Kiri. I was just going to offer, um, it was suggested that we pump out those ditches right now and I know Public Works does not have the manpower to do so so can we hire another company to actually do that in the interim so that would be like ASAP as well as probably come Sunday or Monday with the rain coming and that gives us a week to actually devise a plan. I, I, I like that suggestion Michelle in terms of the interim because and I think that's more along the lines of what Sherry Lynn was uh, suggestion as well in terms of the emergency response. Um, so maybe we could look to that as a discussion for next steps and where we go from, from that point. But I do agree that we should have an interim plan uh, in uh, leading up to our more long-term plans and what we're, our strategic direction is going to be. Kerry? Yeah, the, just one, one problem, one other problem that we have to deal with is uh, beavers. There's a lot of beaver out there and they're causing a lot of flooding. Matter of fact, they're down on Mackenzie Creek. They're just um, east of uh, Isle Thomas School. I don't know if they've completely blocked that the creek off yet or not, but it's it's starting to back up. It, well, it has been for the last week or so. So that's another problem that we have to deal with. Uh. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Carrie, for bringing bringing that forward as well. I just wanted to recognize uh, Wendy's comment in the chat of have we accessed the emergency management assistance program, which covers flood mitigation preparedness response and recovery to funding on support or funding to support on reserve emergency management. I um, just wanted to check in with that, um, Mike, if, if you know of any of, of those um, pieces to this. We've accessed a, a few programs just to get those studies done that we got done. But I'd have to um, look at my counterparts at SAT to see if they access that program at all uh, within their program, such as you know just emergency response in general. But that's definitely a good lead I can look into. Oh, I see Wendy has her hand up. Yeah, it's specific to, to flooding. Very specific. They did eighty point something million in twenty twenty, I think. So there's probably money sitting there. So maybe perhaps we can we can look at that piece as well. I'm still looking to Michelle's idea or suggestion in the interim, uh, but also want to acknowledge Helen's uh, comment in the chat of what ditch, Michelle, are you referring to getting pumped out? I would suggest the one on town line as well as the residents on third line. Okay, thank you for that, Michelle. Um, is there any way that we can look to, again, because I know obviously we, we know timing is of, a, of an essence. Is there any way that we can look to uh, just to get these pumped out, the, the two ditches that Michelle's referring to, town line and third line, uh, and just do the cost uh, through one of councils, whether it be, uh, or I'm not sure if even if, if public works, any if it can squeeze out of any other budget from there or ours until we look to these, this program as well? Just trying to look for solutions and next steps here. Helen? Um, um, oh, I, I'm not, I don't think it's a good idea to be pumping anybody's ditches out at the present time until we find out what's going on and what we're doing and get more information on everything that we've talked about. If it's going to rain for three more days, then what's the point of pumping it out? Is it going to just fill up again? Are we going to keep pumping it for three days, four days? I don't know these properties, so I don't know how bad it is, but um, 
I don't know about if the one on third line is where all those houses are, where it's full of water in the front. That water's because they filled in a ditch, one of the government ditches. That's why it's floods and where them houses are, because the, the water floods wherever people filled in the ditch. So that's what that flooding is from. I don't know if you can pump it out and continue pumping while it's flooding, but I don't agree with doing anything like that at the present time until we figure out what we're doing and get a plan in place and start looking at what needs to get done. I mean, there's other homes that as well that just haven't contacted us. Like, you know, I don't know. I just don't think it's a good idea to move on that right now. Okay, thanks, Helen, for your comments. I do see Rod. Rod had uh, went off of mute. I just want to check in with Rod. Rod, can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of uh, background material on this that probably probably uh, many might not be aware of. But yeah, it, it has to do with the fact that the, a large majority of the reserve is in the Haldeman clay plain. So the, the clay overburden is what's preventing the water from seeping. So there's this perception that um, it's the water table. And, and because we're swampy area, that, that by no amount of pumping will relieve, relieve the level of water. But uh, indications are that uh, looking at the topographical maps, that there's a lot of low-lying areas that are surrounded by um, higher elevations. And so with the clay soil, and, and there's no outlet for that water to go, it just sits there. And with each subsequent rain event or precipitation event, it's getting higher. So we, I did witness this over the course of the past month on, on Indian Town Line. Uh, after every rain event, it did, get, it did creep up people's dri um, driveways and property higher. So it's not going anywhere. So that was that was the, the recommendation or the suggestion was that um, we can't, I don't know how much more rain we can take and people will not be able to get into their homes or if their well head's not properly sealed, the water could start seeping into the well. Um, if the water stays, if we get some frost thaw cycles there, there could be some other property damage if things are under underwater. So that was that was kind of all of these types of considerations is what is what we're trying to look at on an interim basis and realizing that there's going to have to be a longer strategy going forward with with all of the drainage ditches. But that was just the context for um, why why some are suggesting that we we try to pump it out now before it gets any higher. And then if we do get another hurricane hazel <laughs> event, uh, then we just we, we have to keep doing this pumping. I don't I know it's going to get it could get potentially get expensive, but that was that was the emergency response threshold is how how how, how much higher are we going to allow it to go so before we, we before we do something so that was the context so i just wanted to share that okay thank you uh thank you for the for sharing uh that uh, rod uh want to again so just by from hearing that you know is there or is that a possibility in the interim uh looking to darren or mike that we can at least start with the third line and town line i know uh, uh, Helen is opposed to doing something like that in the interim, but I agree, you know, we have to look to these pieces now, as Nathan's alluded to, you know, there's only more rain to come. So just want to check in with Darren. Yeah, we, we I, I spoke to Anna Cecile about this and we can do as much or as little, um, but I think, you know, we look at what, where the, where the um, urgency areas are. But, you know, I, I also take that with, with the consideration of Rod saying, like, like we're, we're in this area where it's all clay. Um, where, where do we pump it? Where does it, I guess it would just be transported off somewhere. Um, but we have, we have some funding, um, not a lot in surplus, but not a lot um, in terms of the administration side. Um, the alternative would be if it gets to be a, a more expensive, then we would look at uh, profiling some of the uh, casino funds to help offset the cost as an interim measure. We can do it, I guess, is, is the long and short of it. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Darren. Uh, I see Wendy has her hand up. Yeah, two two good cases being made. I mean, I on one hand, I agree with Helen because you know, in order to identify those priorities, we don't know what they are. These are just two that have surfaced, right? So by virtue of somebody coming forward, they become a priority, but we don't know what's out there. And I that's what I understood Helen was saying. Is there a way to do both? I mean. If the pumping is an immediate need because of emergency crisis, can we do that? I don't know where it gets pumped to. Um, but then, I mean, I would think we're going to have a lot of people coming forward. 
So we need to have a plan of action right away. So this is something that has to be moved to the you know top of the priority list that's already huge and find some solutions. So I really think we need to pull together what information do we have right now in front of us that we can just pull together and organize so that we know which direction to go. Pumping is one thing, what are all the other pieces that we have to do? And how fast yeah, can we I, I, I agree. Is that something that maybe perhaps even Nathan as the chair, um, Mike, uh, yourself, Darren, myself, Rod, that we can maybe meet tomorrow on uh, and see, and like Wendy is saying, pull together the, the pieces uh, and then come up with that plan and present it back to council. Because again, I think we need to do this quite quickly to Michelle's point. Um, so just wondering if that's maybe an option instead of going around in circles at this evening, because we know we've listed out a number of solutions. Uh, is it possible to meet tomorrow um, on this specific issue and pull together all what we know and then start to work on the, that plan of action? Darren? And I would like to and also include Ashley Russell Taylor. Um, Definitely. He's been quite instrumental in emergency response as well. So he could have some, offer some suggestions. And, you know, in terms of, uh, he's really good at triaging as well. So we can just include him on that. And tomorrow afternoon, I'm available. Okay, so let's, Nathan, are you okay as well to join, uh, to, uh, to assist with us on, on this issue? I was gonna say, I'm only available tomorrow morning, but <laughs> um, afternoon, I can probably make work after three o'clock. Okay, so Actually, let's- Actually, 2.30, uh, let's, 2 let's, I can do 2.30. Let's, let's go with that then. Uh, let's set let's set a meeting uh, with Mike and Rod and Nathan and Darren myself, uh, all those who can pull together as much as we know. Uh, so Mike will ask to do some preparedness on some historical backgrounds and overviews so that we can start to bring this plan forward, uh, and then from there we'll look to advise council on our next step of action here on this particular issue because I know uh, we do uh, looking at the time, uh, you know, there's nothing more that we can do at this point in time other than start to put that plan together and look to the interim basis. So um, I'll look to schedule that meeting tomorrow afternoon uh, with each of you and we'll look for, go from there, devise a plan and uh, advise council as, as, as to next steps. Does that sound okay with council? Thumbs up, perfect. Okay, thank you uh, Nathan and Michelle for bringing this item forward. Uh, looking to Rod, Darren, Nathan, myself and Mike uh, to uh, have our meeting tomorrow. Uh, look to see what we come up with and we'll look to update council, council as soon as possible on this issue. Okay, that being said, that's all I have for the open session of the agenda. That's the new business items. Is there any further questions or comments? If not, then I will look to a motion to adjourn. Moved by Sherry Lynn, seconder. Second by Wendy, all in favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, looking forward to our next uh, live stream.